welcome to our Bible study for United Methodist Church. Senior Pastor Reverend Ellis White Jr. and we're grateful to have you join us. All right, let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in the strong name of Jesus, we thank you for this day and for the blessings of we thank you for grace and for and we thank you for this season of Advent as birth of your son, Jesus Christ. Now, Father, we pray that you will be with us as we rightly divide the word of that you would provide us with insight and wisdom as we seek to be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, we're having a little mic trouble here, but we're going to get it right, and we want you to hold up your Bibles as we do our faith confession. Repeat after me, this is my Bible. It is the word of God. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. It's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. From it I receive revelation and inspiration to reign in life and to have life more abundantly. In Jesus' name. Amen. Foundational past scripture, Proverbs 1 through 16, 1 through 3. When you have it, say amen. All right. All right. Let's read it. The plans of the mind belong to mortals, but the answers of the tongue is from the Lord. All of one's ways may be pure in one's own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. Our topic is how to handle your crisis, managing change. Now, tonight we're dealing with uh, four things that you are responsible uh, in, in doing in the midst of your crisis. There are four things that you can do in the midst of your crisis, and the first one we looked at was controlling your mind. You can control your thoughts. The second one is controlling your mouth. You control what you say. You see, as a man thinketh, so is he, and death and life is in the power of the tongue. You reap what you speak. You can control what you think, and you can control what you speak. The third thing is you can control your response. You can control how you react to the crisis. And one of the things that uh, you've got to remember is that you've got to focus on the problem, on the promise versus the problem. Amen. You cannot be quick tempered. You cannot be hot headed. You cannot operate in fear. You got to operate in faith. Um, and then finally, tonight I'm kind of moving fast because I want to conclude this lesson, end it tonight. Uh, <clears throat> the fourth thing is you got to control your perception. Now, your perception 
of a thing will determine your interpretation of the thing. Because when you talk about perception, if you see yourself as a victim in the midst of your crisis, then you operate as a victim. The crisis or the circumstance will win. You see, <clears throat> our focus and how we see ourselves is vitally important because God has designed us to function in concert with how we see ourselves. If you see yourself as a victim, then you will operate with a victim's mentality. But you see yourself as God sees you, and God sees you as more than a conqueror. Man, you see, <clears throat> a crisis is an environment that requires an unscheduled response, a response you never had before. And it will require that you do some innovative thinking. You, know, you see, situations come in. And we tend to discover that we have the ability to do some things we didn't think we had. You see, crisis helps because in good times, you don't think. And crisis becomes the source of your activity. You never grow in good times. You grow in tough times. Amen. So there are four passages of scripture that I want to look at that you need to avoid in the midst of a crisis, all right? The first one is in Numbers 13, 6 through 33. And the first thing you need to avoid is fear. Somebody say fear. All right, let's turn to Numbers 13. And we'll read verses 26 through 33. All right, when you have it, say amen. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the Israelites in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Yet the people who live in the land are strong, and the towns are fortified and very large. And besides... We saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalekites live in the land of the Najab. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against this people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the Israelites an unfavorable report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land that we have gone through as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of great size. There we saw the Nephilians, the, Ana, the, the, the Anakites, come Nephilians. And to ourselves, we seem like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. Amen. You see, the children of Israel, instead of listening to the bold faith of How they could not, they could not occupy the land that the Lord had. 
they saw themselves as grasshoppers. And so, instead of operating out of faith, they operated out of fear. And their perception was that the giants of the land saw them, saw them as grasshoppers, and so they saw themselves as grasshoppers. Again, God has created us to function in concert with how we see ourselves. And if you see yourself as losing, then you will lose. Amen? All right. Another familiar passage we got to look at. Let's turn to Jonah. Jonah 1, verses 1 through 3. you have it, say amen. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up against, up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went to Joppa, and found the ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare, went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. All right? The second response that we get is flight. <clears throat> that in the midst of your crisis, you can't run. You got to face it in order for faith and for God to fix it. Running from it, ignoring it, won't make it go away. And you will not get the blessing that is couched in the midst of the crisis. And Jonah instead of listening to God and go and preach to the people of Nineveh, he decided he would go another way. And he did this simply because he did not like the people of Nineveh and he knew that if he had preached God's word, they would repent and God would spare them. But he didn't want God to spare them. He wanted God to destroy them and so he, did, he ignored his purpose. He ignored what God had told him to do and he ran. And he ran into a storm and ended up swallowed up by a great fish. Amen? And so when you run, you make it worse. You run from something, you end up running into something. Amen? All right? Let's look at our third passage of scripture. Numbers 20, 3 through 13. And this passage deals with frustration. Frustration. When you have it, say man. All right. Numbers 20, 3 through 13. All right. Let me read it. And it says, the people quarreled 
with Moses and said, Would that we had died when our kindred died before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to bring us to this wretched place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranate and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went away from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting. They fell on their faces and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the staff, assemble the congregation, you and your brother Aaron, and command, command the rock before their eyes to yield its water. Thus, thus you shall bring water out of the rock for them, and thus you shall provide drink for the congregation and their livestock. So Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he had commanded him. Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Listen, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water came out abundantly and the congregation and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me to show my holiness before the eyes of Israelites, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and by which he showed his holiness. Amen. Now, this passage of scripture shows where Moses was commanded by God to speak to the rock in order to bring forth water to the children of Israel. But they had gotten on Moses' last nerve, quarreling and complaining, and Moses had had enough. And he got so frustrated until he did not do what God said do. Instead of operating out of his faith to show forth God's holiness, he operated out of his emotions. Therefore, and instead of speaking to the rock, he struck it, hit it twice, and the water came out. And because of that one mistake, Moses, who had endured so much with the children of Israel, got right to the point where they were about to enter the promised land. And he lost the privilege, him and Aaron, to take the children of Israel into the promised land because they acted out of frustration. And he allowed his temper to get the best of him. You can't respond when you're frustrated or else you will operate out of your emotions instead of your faith. All right? Now, the last passage, turn with me to Acts 5, 1 and 11. Acts 5, 1 and 11. If you have it, say amen. <clears throat> but a man named Ananias, with the consent of his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property with his wife's knowledge. He kept back 
part, he kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was, it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. Now when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard it. The young men came and wrapped up his body, then carried him out and buried him. And after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Peter said to her, tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. And then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. And when the young men came in, they found her dead. So they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard of these things. Amen. <clears throat> Fraudulent. This is what did Ananias and Sapphira in. During that time at the time, the community of faith had agreed that everyone would uh, put in so that no one would have need. And Ananias and Sapphira agreed to sell some property. And they did. But instead of bringing the proceed of the sale, they kept some back and pretended that this was the price that they sold with what they brought to the apostles, which wasn't the case. They held back some and didn't represent the true price of the property. And thus, they died for it. They fell dead for it. And one of the things that you can't do is be fraudulent. You can't fake it. Be honest. Tell the truth. It is what it is. If you agree to do it, stick to your word. You know, don't, don't, don't decide to, to, to say one thing and then do another thing because you're not lying to people. You're lying to God. And nowadays, you may not fall physically and die, but something dies when you are not honest with God. You know, your, your integrity dies. Your, your good name dies. Uh, folk don't trust you. Folk won't depend on you anymore. You know, you lose when you aren't upfront and honest. So don't be fraudulent. Amen? All right? Now, <clears throat> the next thing I want us to look at as we quickly conclude this teaching, I want you to turn with me to uh, Psalm 91. I want you to turn with me to Psalm 91. And I'm going to have you write down these pages are sticking. 
I'm going to have you write down these All right, Psalm 91. All right. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to read this for you, and then I'm going to put some notes up for you to, to take. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler, you will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalk in darkness or the destruction that wastes at noontime. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. And when they call to me I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. And with long life. I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Amen. Now, let's look at a Psalms 91 plan of protection. All right? Where is your dwelling place? We see that in verse number one. That your dwelling place should be you live in the shelter of the Most High and abide in the shadow of the Almighty. All right? We dwell by believing that God is our place of refuge and protection. Now, are you dwelling with the promise or are you dwelling with the problem? All right? What are you saying? We must not only believe, but we must say that God is our refuge and fortress. We got to speak that. Amen? And then verse 3. Who is your deliverer? We got to know that God is your deliverer and when someone or something else delivers you, it will also have the power to imprison you. Who God delivers, he keeps. Amen? All right? And then verse 4. Take cover. You see... We have the option to take cover under God's wing. And when God covers us, it means that the enemy has to go through God to get to us, which is impossible. But it is up to us. If you run, take flight, then you leave your covering. We are covered because God is faithful and God is unmovable. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Verse 
Number five and six, do not be afraid. Do not, do not fear what you can't see because terror causes you to be paralyzed and not move. Do not fear the arrows of personal attacks. Do not fear the pestilence of the things that seek to rob you of your worth, which could cause sickness, which is a deception and a trick of the enemy. Do not fear destruction or the storms of life that seeks to destroy us and our faith in God. Amen? All right, the next thing in this protection plan, verses seven through eight. This is a measure of prevention for the believers. You activate your promises. Amen. And then the next thing, verses 11 through 12, remember your helpers. You got angels on your side. You got angelic help. Amen. And then keep the enemy under you. You see, the place of the enemy is under your feet. You see, the lion is symbolic of problems. The adder is symbolic of a sneak attack. Young lion is symbolic of small problems. And serpents is the symbolic of deceit and lies. But you keep all of that under you. You place it under your feet. And then finally, you remember the seven promises of love. Verses 14 through 16. And then deliverance. Protection. Answers to your prayers, presence in trouble, rescue and honor, long life and satisfaction. You see God's salvation when you're under his protection plan. Amen. So whatever you're up against, you face that crisis with faith and know that if God is for you, he's more than anything against you. I'm out of time. God bless you. Have a Merry Christmas. This is our last Bible study for the year 2020. We pray that you be safe and that you remember we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in this season, we know that Jesus is the reason. We pray your abundant blessing over your people. Keep us and we will be kept. Guide us and instruct us. Fill us with the wisdom that only you can give. And we thank you, Father, that all things are working together for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed Christmas. Happy New Year. Amen.